Be attentive. Wisdom as proclaimed in the 51st Psalm. Have mercy on me, God, in your goodness. In your abundant compassion, blot out my offense. Wash away all my guilt, for my, from my sin cleanse me. For I know my offense, my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. I have done such evil in your sight that you are just in your sentence, blameless when you condemn. True, I was born guilty, a sinner, even as my mother conceived me. Still, you insist on sincerity of heart. In my innermost being, teach me wisdom. Cleanse me with hyssop that I may be pure. Wash me, make me whiter than snow. Let me hear sounds of joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Heavenly Father, each one of us acknowledges in our heart that we are sinners, unworthy. And yet, in spite of our unfaithfulness, in spite of our duplicity, you still choose to love us as your beloved. And you call each and every one of us to turn back to you so that you may claim our hearts for your love and for life everlasting. Send forth again, merciful Father, the spirit of your Son, that we may be cleansed and recreated in his image so that you may love in us what you love in him and through us make your name known and loved throughout the world. And so we praise you, the one and only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. It might seem like the most outrageous statement ever made, but much of our unresolved suffering is due to our own choice and preference. The medievals had a saying that emphasizes this truth. Hell has no walls to keep people in, only walls to keep people out. Strange, isn't it? Those who are in hell freely choose to stay there and resist any attempt to force them out. Human beings freely choose to be racked with suffering, treasure it more than joy and life. Is there any actual evidence for this outrageous claim? Well, let us look at our own propensity to hold a grudge and what it actually does to us. First, when you hold a grudge, you become insane because you become your own torturer. Think about all the times you've held a grudge. Whose life did you plunge into misery through that grudge? The person who wronged you? or yourself. Most often the person you're holding the grudge against doesn't even care. Your grudge just hurts you. It makes you miserable. And yet you won't forgive. You clutch to that grudge more than to anything else and if somebody suggests you might want to let it go, God forbid. When I was in high school, I had an art teacher who reported me for flirting with a girl during class. Well, that made me a little bit upset with her, and I held a grudge for the rest of the year. At the end of the year, though, one of my paintings won an award in an exhibition, and she was going to exhibit it in her cart class. 
Well, I held so much a grudge against her that I deliberately destroyed that painting. Now, it did hurt her, but it hurt me a lot more. I lost the honor and joy of my own work and talent. In destroying the painting, I was deliberately and spitefully hurting myself deeply just to inflict a slight injury on her. It was like scratching her with a knife that I had first plunged through my own heart. And what was worst of all, I freely and spitefully decided to do it and fiercely defended my actions and decision. Isn't that weird? To get even, I'd burn myself up just to get you a little warm. But that's exactly what each one of us does when we hold a grudge. And each one of us is holding a grudge right now. We value pain more than joy. We treasure misery more than life. In holding a grudge, we adopt and make our own the evil and malice done to us. Then we treasure it and nurture it and allow it to repeat its evil in our heart over and over again, deliberately reliving the violence or the betrayal or the insult done to us. Let me give you another image. Holding a grudge is like this. Let us imagine that at the end of this conference, someone really takes exception to what I've said. And to make sure I know that they disagree, as they pass me on the way out of the church, they take out a big hat pin. And as they go by, they let me have it. Oh, that would hurt. It'd make the point, though. Ah, but when I go upstairs, I'm mad. Oh, how could she do such a thing? And to make sure I do not forget what that rotten woman did, tomorrow morning I go out and I buy my own hat pin. And every time I begin to forget what she did and actually begin to enjoy myself, I take my hat pin and I let myself have it again. Maybe I'm sitting down to a good meal. I almost forget what that wretched woman did, and I take my hat pin and I let myself have it again. Wouldn't you think I was totally insane? I mean, that is insanity, isn't it? To ruin my own life? Besides, I'm not hurting her. She's probably dying laughing. Why would I do such a thing? But ask yourself, why do you hold grudges? Because that's precisely what each one of us does when we hold a grudge. We relive the evil done to us over and over again, relive it with all of its pain and its shame. It tears our lives up, but we won't give it up. We treasure it, we nurture it, and we hold it fast as it destroys our lives. Secondly, holding a grudge makes us act in such a way as to ensure that our suffering is both intolerable and unresolved. Because our misery and agony has become part of our self-identity, a real part of our inner being, it grows and feeds on every other disappointment and pain that we encounter until it dominates our lives. And here the suffering becomes unresolvable because it becomes one with our own self-identity. It becomes who we are. Many years ago, I ministered to a man who was dying. When he was a young man, he was deeply cheated by a New Yorker. In fact, this New Yorker cheated him out of everything. He held a grudge. It began to fester. Beware. Later, he was fired by his boss, who just happened to be from New York. Oh, the two things fit together. 
Now two grudges, more festering. And then he began to read about all the corrupt politicians in New York, not hard to find, and the festering grew more. In the end, he hated anyone and everything about New York. As far as he was concerned, New York was the cause of all the troubles in the United States. Now he's dying. And there was one nurse, very good, he could not bear to touch him. Do you know why? She was from New York. I tried to get him to repent and forgive. But he simply stated the truth. This is who I am. I hate New York and everything about it. Notice, this is not part of himself. This is who he is. This is the beginning of hell. We choose hell ourselves. We build it. We nourish it. We hold it close. It's a matter of our own free decision. It's our own preference. Because this man refused to forgive and deliberately held that grudge which grew. The grudge became his self-identity. His misery became who he was. And that's irresolvable. And finally, by holding a grudge, we make its agony contagious by destroying the lives of others and plunging them into our own private hell. The very hell we not only freely choose, but stubbornly and spitefully defend and fortify. As soon as we begin to hold a grudge, it infects all of our attitudes and all of our responses to others, so that it distorts our ability to love, to sympathize, to be aware of and sensitive to others. When I refuse to forgive, I'm not only destroying my own life, I'm destroying the life of everyone else who comes in contact with me. I also talk to the wife of this gentleman. She very clearly pointed out that his hatred for New York made a hell for his wife and kids. One of her daughters had moved to New York, so he refused to see her. He literally disowned her for something so petty. But it really caused a deep pain and agony in the heart of the woman who called him husband. His son, by the way, got a job with the firm that its headquarters were in New York. And he disowned his son as conspirator in a New York plot to corrupt America. By this time, his grudge has become real insanity and paranoia. His own grudge, then, becomes mental illness. But he could not see it because he had become who he was. And now his insanity became a living hell for those who loved him. Our grudges... Resentments are parasitic on ourselves, eating us alive and leaving but an emotional shell of our true selves. And worst of all, it doesn't have to be this way. It is something that we deliberately choose for ourselves. That's the real horror. No one imposed it on me. I chose it. And I deliberately remain in it. That's why if you read the New Testament, you will discover that Jesus commands you to do what? Forgive your neighbor from your heart regardless. That commandment is given to us not once, not twice. It is repeated over and over and over and over again. And then Jesus gets even more blunt. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven because you have chosen your own hell. And what you freely choose, you will get. Like grudges, there's a second way in which we freely choose our own misery and tragedy. 
And it's called self-pity. We all choose to be sorry for ourselves. Self-pity causes us to reject joy and goodness in favor of the pain and evil that lives within us. And remember, the pain and evil might even be imaginary, something you imagine someone said about you. Oh, but we center whatever offense was done against us in our heart and we begin with the poor little me. Haven't you done that? We get into these wonderful blue states and here we really have a contradiction. We enjoy our misery. We really do. We get in these blue funks and we don't want anyone to get us out of them. We just sit there and are miserable. And the more miserable we become, in a weird sense, the more we like it. There's a wonderful German term for this. They call it entlarvung. They're referring to an insect that when you mess with it, it rolls up into a little ball. Ever seen them? Sometimes they're called pill bugs. Millipedes do the same thing. They roll up in a ball and they shut everything else outside. Well, that's what we do in self-pity. I roll myself around my misery. But I shut out God's love. I shut out your love. I shut out everything that is good. And I just center in upon that misery and enjoy it. And so what is disturbing is that we take pleasure in our own misery. Here pleasure is truly perverted by sin into the love of pain and misery. It is a spiritual disease that we call masochism. We cannot be happy unless we are miserable. And if you live enough self-pity, that becomes who you are. You can't enjoy anything good. You have to hurt in order to be happy. To me, that's the perfect definition of hell. We stay in hell because we cannot be happy unless we are miserable. You can see this begin to work even in the lives of children. And we adults are really responsible for a lot of damage. You know, if you don't show a child attention for being good then the child is going to do things that upset you in order that you give it what? Attention. What you don't see is it's now beginning to associate your discipline, your anger, your yelling, not only with attention, but with love. And after a while, the child can't receive love in the normal way. The only way it can understand being loved is by being abused. But God doesn't abuse. And so we've opened up a gap in that child's life to the love of God. He can't even imagine who God is because when he thinks of God, it has to be a cruel God or it couldn't love him. Oh, how we have messed things up and we decided to do it. Think of all the battered women who continually return to the man who batters them. That always blows my mind. San Francisco, I worked with battered women, trying very hard to get them to separate from the men who were beating them to start new lives. A few times I felt very successful. I'd actually gotten a couple of women, in a sense, to move out from these men. And then one of them got married again. I thought, well, thank heavens, it's a new beginning. I hadn't met him. When I did, mamma mia. He was another wife beater. She just changed one horror for what? Another. How we set ourselves up. And both holding a grudge and wallowing in self-pity are sins. For they are a deliberate rejection of love especially God's love, which is always present to us and will envelop us the moment we freely choose to surrender to his love. I don't have to live in this misery. But if I want out, I need to repent and I need to forgive. But as soon as I do, 
God can change everything. I have a good friend who is a multimillionaire in Alaska. He buys himself a new car every year. Isn't that nice? And I mean a nice car. I was present one time when he drove home his new car. His daughter wanted to borrow it to go to the mall. Her mother had the other car. Mike was a little reluctant to give her the keys, but he finally gave in, gave her the keys. She drove the car to the mall. While she's in the mall, someone backed out and put a little dent in his rear fender. It wasn't her fault. There's nothing she could do to prevent it. But when she drove the car back and told Mike what had happened, he went ballistic. His new car was dented. Well, his daughter went running up the stairs in tears, and he looked at me for sympathy. I didn't have any. I mean, your daughter's important. Who cares about your car? You know, this was wrong. Why do we put little things as more important than the real important things in our lives? And what was worse is he began holding a grudge against his daughter for denting his new car. Then I called him insane. He asked me to leave. I did. I was back in Alaska the, year, the next year. Mike called up, apologized, said he'd really changed his life. I said, what have you done about your daughter? He said, we've, we've made up. We've apologized. I've forgiven her. I said, did you realize you, she didn't really do anything wrong? He said, oh, I understand. I said, all right, what do you want? He said, well, I bought a new car. I said, all right. He said, I want you to come bless the new car, but I think you'll be pleased this time. Well, I almost said no, but I said, all right, I'll be there. So I went out to their house, and uh, I was with his wife and his two daughters and some friends, and there's this new car in the driveway, and Mark's, I mean, uh, Mike's in the uh, garage. And just as I'm about ready to start blessing the car, he comes out, and he has something behind his back. And he says, Father, before you bless it, I have something to do. So I said, what is it? He took out a hammer, went to his car, and he put a dent in it. <laughs> now all of us are in shock. And then he looks at his daughter and said something wonderfully beautiful. He said, this is to remind me that my daughter is worth more than any car. And then he looked at the rest of us and smiled and said, and after the first, uh, the second's not so bad. <laughs> but do you understand the wisdom of the man? He crushed the grudge. He would not allow it to become a living hell for him, separating him from his daughter. And then he acted in the best way he could to make sure that he would crush that same hurt in his daughter's heart. She understood. They really were reconciled. Well, if we want to escape from the dual prison, the dual hell of grudge and self-pity, there's some things we're going to need to do. First, we're going to have to repent of the part we played. One of the ways in which God brings good out of evil while respecting our free will is to bring us to repentance through the very vain suffering our sins invoke. God turns our suffering against itself. Pope John Paul II speaks forcibly that one function of all suffering is to wake us up to the truth that something is not right not only in this corrupt world, but within ourselves. When I am not happy, when I'm miserable inside, something's wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I need then to begin, begin to repent of the sin of holding a grudge and the sin of self-pity. Remember, all suffering that is not resolved in the avoidance of evil or in the very act of growth is senseless and calls our attention to our own sinfulness and urges us to resolve it in repentance and reconciliation with God, self, and others. The Pope writes, This is an extremely important aspect of suffering. 
It is profoundly rooted in the entire revelation of the Old and above all the New Covenant. Suffering must serve for conversion, that is, for the rebuilding of goodness in the subject who can recognize the divine mercy in this call to repentance. The purpose of penance is to overcome evil, which under different forms lies dormant in man. Its purpose is also to strengthen goodness both in man himself and in his relationships with others, and especially with God. God can use our own misery to call us home. When I suffer too much, I turn back to God. And that's what God wants. Repentance is basically personal honesty. The courage to cooperate with grace in bringing a greater good out of the very evil that afflicts us. This authentic repentance has three movements. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to hammer it home again. I repent when I take personal responsibility for my life and my actions, good and bad. It means I don't make excuses. I don't blame. We're always blaming someone else. And that's going to keep us trapped. When I was much, much younger, maybe five or six, I got into trouble by trying to jump from my sister's bed to my bed. Well, I managed it, but I, in hitting my bed, dislodged a lamp from the little side table and broke it. My father came in really upset. He wanted to know who broke the lamp. Well, I couldn't refuse that, so I acknowledged it, but I immediately pointed out to him it was not my fault, it was my sister's fault, because she dared me. He looked at me and said, you take all dares. I said, if you don't, you're a sissy. He said, all right. I have a hammer here. I dare you to smash your thumb with this hammer. <laughs> well, I didn't take that dare. No way. And then he looked at me and said, now don't blame your sister. You didn't have to take that dare either. You did it. You're what? You're responsible. True, other people and things can initiate and aggravate the evil situation. But let's be honest. We did it. After I have willingly taken responsibility for my life and my actions, I need to take the time and to examine closely the dynamics and cause of the suffering and tragedy and learn from them. At one time, my doctor called me to task for smoking. He wanted me to stop. I tried, and I found it almost impossible. When I stopped smoking, I became irritable and mean and vengeful. In fact, I was so bad that my fellow students in the Dominican House of Studies would pull their allowances and go out and buy me a carton of cigarettes <laughs> so I would act normally. But as I stopped and really looked into what happened, I suddenly realized that the reason I smoked was to be sociable. I started smoking in the Navy, because there's not too much you have in common with other young men, in a sense. And smoking is one of the things you can have in common. You light cigarettes, you trade cigarettes, you... it's a social interaction. Of course, after I started smoking, I became addicted, but at least I knew a little bit of the reason why I smoked. It was to be social. I guess I'm not the most social person. I'm really an introvert. The worst thing about me is I like myself. So if nobody's around, it doesn't bother me. I'm perfectly happy. I have to force myself to greet people and all the rest of that. But after you learn some of the conditions that affect the evil you're doing, you have to put it into practice. 
And I realized that if I was going to stop smoking, it was going to have to be like I began. It would have to have some kind of social interaction. God gave that to me while I was preaching a mission in Los Angeles with Father Basil Cole. Some of you might remember Father Basil Cole. We'd heard confessions all morning, and he needed a break. So he came up to my confessional door and knocked. I opened it up, a little bit upset about who would do such a thing, and he told me we were going to take a 15-minute break. And I said, that's fine. And so he decided he would go get us two cups of coffee, and then I'd go out the side door and I'd have a cigarette. Well, while he went for the coffee, I went out the side door of the church, which opens onto the playground, which is also the parking lot, and I lit up my cigarette. And there were a group of junior high school kids lounging around the fence. They saw me light up my cigarette. They all waved at me. I waved back to them. They opened up their purses and reached in their pockets. They got up their cigarettes, and they lighted up. Now I was a little bit upset. I don't mind destroying my life. But I don't want to be the cause of the destruction of other people's lives. But how am I going to go up to these kids and tell them put out their cigarettes when one is dangling out of my own mouth? That's hypocrisy. Well, Basil came back and we both went back in. He went straight to his confessional. I stopped for a minute at the foot of the altar and I prayed. And I prayed with all my heart. I wanted those kids to stop smoking. And I was willing to do penance for that. I told God that I wanted to stop smoking and I wanted to offer up all of the pain and irritability and everything that went along with it for the sake of those kids that they would stop. Went in, heard confessions. When it came time for lunch, we went in and had lunch. And then after lunch, what do you do? You get a cup of coffee and a cigarette. Well, Basil got his cup of coffee, I got mine, but I didn't want a cigarette. I have never wanted a cigarette since. I never had any withdrawal symptoms. So I had to create other penances to do for those young kids. (laughs) But it's surprising that when we really take responsibility and stop whining and blaming everybody else and look at the problems in our lives, and carefully pray over them in God's sight and then do something, what sometimes seemed absolutely impossible for us, a living hell, simply disappears. And then we suddenly realize it was us who kept it alive in the first place. But this repentance is still incomplete. For we have no power to alter the past, and so stand helpless before the consequences of our past actions as they're revealed in the future. So we need help, God's help, God's forgiveness. Only God can change reality. In seeking God's forgiveness, though, we must first set ourselves free of the past evils that parasitize our hearts. And this is accomplished by our deliberate forgiveness of the evil done to us, the crushing of all grudges. But let's clear up a little bit about confession, because some, about a forgiveness, because sometimes it confuses us. First, to forgive the person who hurt you does not mean that you are justifying the evil that they have done. <coughs> Rather, your forgiveness is an act of self-liberation from the evil they did to you. You're not saying they were right in hurting you. When you forgive them, you're saying enough is enough. You hurt me once, but never again. This is my today, and I don't allow anything in the past to corrupt my today. It's the only one I've got. Secondly, to forgive does not mean that we forget. I mean, if you forgot, you wouldn't have to forgive. Isn't that true? You remember. But we learn. That means in forgiving, I'm smarter than I was. Which means I can avoid this same uncomfortable situation in the future. Third, 
to forgive sometimes requires a long time and many acts of forgiveness. I think I have forgiven the man who killed my nephew, but it's taken many years. I hope now if I saw him in real need, I'd be able to go up to him and help him and provide for him, and he would never know that I'm the uncle of the kid he killed. But that takes a little bit of work. So don't get discouraged. Persevere. And finally, to forgive does not mean that we cease to hurt. It does mean, though, that the nature of the hurt changes. It will go away. Finally, we take control of the situation by freely deciding under grace to return good for evil and allow God to bring the one who hurt us to repentance and change of life. St. Paul talks about this. Your forgiveness becomes perfect when you return good for the evil done to you. St. Paul says, Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. There is so much power in that statement. Most of us have never tried it. When we do, mamma mia. Let me give you a not very serious example. My father is not a very emotional person, or he wasn't. And so he never said to me that he actually loved me. Now, he did many wonderful things for me. But I remember com complaining to my mother that he never said he loved me. She said, well, when's the last time you said you loved him? Well, I can't remember saying I loved him either. Like father, like son. So I decided this morning I was going to change things. He was in the living room reading the paper. I sat down in the chair opposite and I said, I love you. And he bent the paper in half, looked over the edge and said, what? I said, I love you. He folded the paper, put it down, got up, walked out the door. I said, I'm not going to let him get away with that. So I went after him. I told him again I loved him. He went outside. It ended up, I'm chasing him around the house. And then I was a little embarrassed because when we finally got to the back porch, he's in tears. There is power in forgiving that you've never even scratched the surface of. And all our forgiveness that sets us free from our grudges and self-pity is made perfect in returning good for evil. And now we have a chance to bring all of it to joy. And that's the sacrament of reconciliation. In that sacrament, God acts on our part to change the evil in our lives and our faulty decisions from disaster, from suffering, into a greater good blessing for those whom we love and for ourselves. Through the sacrament of reconciliation, God reaffirms his love for us. For a few minutes, contrast that sacrament with the civil court. Let's imagine that you've committed a crime, but you've sat down and repented, you've made restitution, You've examined the causes and you've changed your life. You're now no longer liable to make that mistake again. Now you come to the court and you freely confess to the judge what you did. What kind of help do you think the judge is going to give you? He's going to wrap the gravel and he's going to say what? Off to jail. Because in this world... Your mistake is more important than you are. That's why this world is so unjust. 
you could do something perfectly for 20 years and you make one mistake and everybody forgets your 20 years what's the only thing they remember the one mistake isn't that true uh, but what about the sacrament of reconciliation you come in and you tell me all the reasons I probably should throw you out isn't that true but do you know God never gave me the verdict of guilty I can't say to you in confession you're guilty God only gave me one verdict you're innocent that's what absolution is that's the kind of court I want to go to isn't that right if you have to go to court don't you want to go to the one where you are guaranteed if you're honest to be declared what innocent why are people afraid to go to confession and think about it in confession God is telling you that you are infinitely more important than all of your mistakes God loves you in spite of yourself and if you will return to him he will wash all of those mistakes and sins away forever this is heaven this world is a little taste of hell and why won't people go to heaven you go to psychiatrists I have a clerkship in psychiatry I only charge hundred and fifty dollars an hour but I give you absolution free and when we go to confession our value is determined by our union with God which is the fruit of absolution when I receive absolution not only are my grudges and my self-pity crushed and I'm set free and I'm sane again I'm set free to live life to the full and before me there is no obstacle even to eternity I can finally be joyful again let me leave you with one last image there's a beautiful story told in India about a great Maharaja who wanted to test the people who served him so he took off his signet ring the one he sealed all the laws with put it on a table and asked everyone to come up and value it well all of his servants valued the ring in terms of how much gold was in it and how expensive the ruby was and then a young girl came up she took the ring and looked at it and said your majesty off your hand the ring is worthless on your hand it is invaluable that was one wise little girl I won't tell you the ending of the story but it has a very happy ending but the same thing could be said about you and me we create our own hells our own misery and we just stubbornly live in them but we don't have to I can come to God and set myself free without God my life it's worth what it's made of with God the value of my life is infinite in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, when we originally made the Dominican Forum dates, we tumbled to the fact that one of them was going to be on Valentine's Day, and so we thought it would be fitting to at least give a lecture on spousal love. Now, for those of you who've been to some of these before, you know, I have given lectures on theology of the body of John Paul II in quite a lot of places. And that is on spousal love as well. So much of the material I'm going to try to present to you tonight comes from John Paul II's ideas. 
but where I usually concentrate on how spousal love relates to the three states of human nature, which is the first part of his Wednesday audience discourses. Tonight, I'd like to concentrate on his reflection, especially on the epistle to the Ephesians, which forms the second part of his reflections and is basically divided into two parts in considering the sacrament of marriage. And one is where he discusses marriage as a covenant and also as a grace. And the other is where he talks about the nature of the sacramental sign of marriage. And he does this turning around the whole idea of what spousal love actually involves. So in order to get into this, the first thing I'd like to do is point out to you that the epistle to the Ephesians begins with a beautiful hymn, basically, which expresses God's relationship to the world in the order of grace generally. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bestowed on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. What Paul is emphasizing here is that basically the creation of the world was ordered to grace and that this grace is something in which each of us participates because each and every one of us is a part of the plan which God had for us before the creation of the world. We've each been called to this. And after he reflects on this relationship of God the Father to the world through bringing forth a life of grace in the mystery of Jesus Christ as a model for how this grace is given and lived, which is basically his mystical body, then he talks about the Christian vocation as the model of the life of the baptized individual and also as to how it's realized in the community. And the primary place where this occurs is in his reflection on marriage. So in Ephesians chapter 5, what St. Paul does is he takes the general reflection of the fact that God loved the world into existence and then established a relationship with the world, which was ratified in his son, which, as I'm going to show you, has matrimonial uh, metaphor to it at least. It's described that way in the scriptures and it's also described that way in the prophets. And then how to show you how that's implemented in the description that Paul gives of marriage. And it's a description which presupposes what marriage was like already in the creation of the world how it's been, in others, before Adam and Eve committed the sin, how it's been, in a sense, besmirched by the original sin, but then how the sacrament of the New Testament, in which all married couples in Christianity participate because of baptism, is an attempt to recover and even make clearer the relationship, the spousal relationship, which God has with the world. And so what this should point out to the couples or the people contemplating marriage or, you know, because priests and religious or single people basically have a kind of spousal union too. The original spousal union is the one in grace and baptism in which we experience an interpersonal communion with the persons of the Trinity. But then also in priests and in religious, we surrender living the spousal union after the manner of this world but not after the manner of the next, where they neither marry nor given in marriage. Uh, And also, of course, obviously with the priesthood and the celebration of Mass, we implement this relationship of Christ with the Church in a special way, which Paul is going to describe now. So let me give you the text from Ephesians 5.21, and then I'm going to try to show you how St. Paul weaves this into this universal idea of the eternal plan of God in Christ in which he brings forth sinful humanity back into new life in Christ. This is the famous text, Ephesians Ephesians 5.21. 
This is the text that everybody wants to omit the, omit the first two verses of today when they read it in church because they don't want to get in trouble. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she, see that she respects her husband. Now, you'll notice that Paul begins here with this admonition being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. He does this to try to, first of all, establish the fact that the mutual relationship that spousal love asks of us is reciprocal and it's also communitarian. And with respect to Christian marriage, it should flow from fear of the Lord. He begins by talking about the subjection of the wife to the husband. But in this, according to John Paul II, the author does not intend to say that the husband is the lord of his wife, as kind of like a master to a slave. St. Thomas, by the way, doesn't say that either. And that the interpersonal pact proper to marriage is a pact uh, of a kind of the husband exercise a kind of domination over the wife. Instead, what the Pope wants to point out is that the wife, and by mutual attraction, you could say the husband, finds her relationship to Christ in her husband. And the fact that this is true frees this from a one-sided domination. This is why the text begins with, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, love excludes every kind of subjection whereby the wife might be considered a servant or a slave of her husband as a kind of person who's being used or abused or dominated. Rather, mutual subjection always involves the complete gift of the self one to the another. And so, though the author of Ephesians is using terms which people of his time would have understood, be subject to, he corrects these terms on the basis of the virtue of piety, on the virtue of respect. So he doesn't merely emphasize ethics and traditional morality, but seeks to discover, and it's not that he doesn't do that, but he seeks to discover in the traditional morality, which would be comprised of indissolubility and of mutual help, he seeks to discover in that the way Christ relates to his body, the church. In other words, the only fit analogy for marriage in the New Testament is that of Christ relative to his bride, the church. And how does Christ relate to his bride, the church? Christ dies for his bride, the church. In other words, the love which Christ has in his sacred heart involves the total giving of himself for the sake of another. And the same thing has to be true now of spousal love. Redeeming love has to be transformed into spousal love. And by spousal love, what we mean here is that two people with a will give themselves totally and completely to one another so that what they find in each other is like a second self. 
John Paul II, in his book Love and Responsibility, talks about the same idea, and he does this under the rubric of uh, betrothed love. This is what he says there. Love in the individual develops by way of attraction, desire, and goodwill. Love, however, finds its full relationship not in an individual subject, but in a relationship between subjects, between persons. The transformation from I to we is no less important for love than the escape from one's own I by way of attraction, desire, and goodwill. Love, especially of this kind, in the book, and he's talking about conjugal love, is not just an aspiration, but a coming together, a unification of persons. In other words, in spousal love, the good of another becomes my good. And so, it completely precludes abuse, use, and domination. In other words, from a person doesn't say, you're good because you make me feel good or you fulfill me. Instead, the person recognizes in another person, another re- reasoning subject, the fact that that person is willed by God for his own sake and affirms that as you're good because you exist, not because you make me feel good. That's what happened in the original relationship in man and woman, in the original creation of the world. Adam and Eve, you remember, um, were created without sin. They were created in the state of grace. They were also created in perfect integrity. And that integrity is expressed in the book of Genesis before the sin is committed. First of all, in the fact that though they're alone in creation, man is alone in creation, and God says it's not good for man to be alone, man can only find himself fully in a sincere gift of himself to another. And since the trinity of persons aren't alone, in order for man to be completely made in the image and likeness of God, it's absolutely necessary that human beings experience some other like themselves as persons to whom they can give themselves in this mutual gift and reception without fear of domination, without fear of manipulation, without fear of being used for the sake of pleasure, without fear, period. The Trinity does that. Uh, Some of you may be familiar, if you've ever studied Trinitarian theology, they have these very horrendous words they use to talk about the way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other. Uh, They come from Latin and Greek. Uh, One is circumcision, and the other is perichoresis. Well, all these rather horrendous terms mean is that since you have one nature with three persons, three individual freedoms and truths, that all share this one infinite nature, that they spend all of eternity doing nothing but giving and receiving to each other without egotism, without manipulation, without domination, without fear. So in order that man might be fully created in the image of the Trinity, in other words, in order that his erotic tendencies toward another might be completed in ethical tendencies, man has to find another like himself to whom he can give himself, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give themselves to each other. So, from Adam's rib, God creates Eve, and John Paul II says that when Adam looks at Eve for the first time, the first great wedding song is spoken in the history of the human race, the first great cry of joy is given in the history of the human race, because finally there's someone to whom he can give himself totally, who's like him, who can receive this gift and return it, And Adam says, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh to emphasize the identity and yet uniqueness of these two people that both are persons, that both can give themselves in this way. And you know, in Hebrew, there's no superlative degree. So, for example, they wouldn't say the greatest Lord. The way they express the superlative degree is by the use of the genitive case. So the greatest Lord is Lord of Lords. The greatest King is King of Kings. So the greatest identification is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Eve receives this. She receives this recognition. 
She says nothing, but she returns it. And then there's this very peculiar text in Genesis. John Paul II spends quite a lot of time commenting on this text. Uh, it's Genesis 2.24. They were naked and not ashamed. Because their bodies, then, became a vehicle by which they could give the gift of their persons, which had already occurred in their souls, to each other, in a sense, and speak as a sign for this gift of self through the giving of the seed. Not only that, but they could look at each other in a naked sense and not be tempted to domination because they were both in the state of grace and there was no sin and they had integrity. So in other words, the body became a vehicle of the communion of hearts. This is what John Paul II calls the nuptial or spousal meaning of the body. The spousal love which has already occurred in their wills, where they become one, like the Trinity is one, now becomes ratified in the flesh. This is an idea which is very deep in Christianity, is very important. It gets divorce, for instance. Uh, I, I don't know, I find it very strange today that people don't realize divorce is a sin. <laughs> it's contrary to the natural law. Everybody thinks the only sin is in getting remarried. Well, I mean, it's true that some people, some people suffer unjustly from divorce. Their spouses leave them or something like that. But for a person who seeks to dissolve a valid marriage bond, uh, whether it's two savages who jump over a broom in the bush or a sacramental marriage, divorce is a natural evil. It's one of the primary evils that's caused the psychological illness of the Western world. Uh, especially divorce that's no fault on demand. And yet there are all kinds of Catholics uh, and even priests who've argued with me that that there's no sin in divorce. The catechism makes it very clear, though. Divorce is contrary to the natural law. Why? Because marriage is indissoluble as the Trinity is indissoluble. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not leave each other. All right? They don't get divorced. If marriage is supposed to be an image of this, and that's why Jesus, remember when he was asked about divorce in scripture, they said, why did Moses permit a decree of divorce? Jesus says, in the beginning it was not so. It's because of your hardness of heart. Then he quotes the text. Remember, I just quoted that text to you. A man shall leave his father and mother. That's in Ephesians, it's also in Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one. Now, a beautiful reflection on this idea that's involved in the giving of self and spousal love is oddly enough found in C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. I don't know if many of you know who C.S. Lewis is. He's the one that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, These are letters from a senior tempter in hell to a junior tempter on earth of how to tempt someone away from Christianity. Listen to what this reflection is on spousal love. Uh, The senior tempter in hell is Screwtape. The junior tempter is... Uh, Wormwood. My dear Wormwood, even under Slubgob, you must have learned at college the routine technique of sexual temptation. And since for us spirits this whole subject is one of considerable tedium, because they don't have bodies, obviously, though necessary as a part of our training, I will pass over it. But on the larger issues, I think you have a good deal to learn. The enemies, that's to say Christ's dilemma, Takes the form, demand takes the form of a dilemma, either complete abstinence or unmitigated monogamy. Ever since our father's first great victory, which would be the original sin, we have rendered the former very difficult to them. The latter, for the last few centuries, we've been closing up as a way of escape. We've done this with the poets and the novelists, and dare I say the media, because this was written in 1940, by persuading the humans that a curious and usually short-lived experience, which they call being in love, is the only respectable ground for marriage, that marriage can and ought to render this excitement permanent, and that a marriage which does not do so is no longer binding. This idea is our parody of an idea that came from the enemy. Now, this idea that came from the enemy, that's Christ, is spousal love. The whole philosophy of hell rests on the recognition of the axiom that one thing is not another thing. 
and especially that one self is not another self. My good is my good, and your good is yours. What one gains, another loses. Even an inanimate object is what it is by excluding all other objects from the space it occupies. If it expands, it does so by thrusting other objects aside or by absorbing them. A self does the same. With beasts, remember this is Hell's philosophy now, the absorption takes the form of eating. For us, it means the sucking of will and freedom out of a weaker self into a stronger. To be means to be in competition. Now, the enemy's whole philosophy is nothing more nor less than one continued attempt to evade this very obvious truth. He aims at a contradiction. Things are to be many, yet somehow also one. The good of one self is to be the good of another. This impossibility he calls love. And this same monotonous panacea can be detected under all he does and even all he is or claims to be. Thus he is not content, even himself, to be a sheer arithmetical unity. He claims to be three as well as one, in order that this nonsense about love might find a foothold in his own nature. At the other end of the scale, he introduces into matter that obscene invention, the organism, in which the parts are perverted from their natural destiny to competition and made to cooperate. His real motive for fixing on sex as the method of reproduction among humans is only too apparent from the use he has made of it. Sex might have been, from our point of view, quite innocent. It might have been merely one more mode in which a stronger self preyed upon a weaker, as it is indeed among the spiders, where the bride concludes her nuptials by eating the groom. But in the humans, the the enemy has gratuitously associated affection between the parties with sexual desire. He has also made the offspring dependent on the parents, given the parents an impulse to support it, thus producing the family, which is like the organism, only worse. For the members are more distinct, yet also united in a more conscious and responsible way. The whole thing, in fact, turns out to be simply one more device for dragging in love. Now comes the joke. The enemy described a married couple as one flesh. He did not say a happily married couple or a couple who married because they were in love. But you can make the humans ignore that. You can also make them forget that the man they call Paul did not confine it to married couples. Mere copulation for him makes one flesh. You can thus get the humans to accept his rhetorical eulogies of being in love what were in fact plain descriptions of the real significance of sexual intercourse. The truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman, there whether they like it or not, a transcendental relationship is set up between them which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. From the true statement that this transcendental relation was intended to produce, and if obediently entered into too often will produce affection in family, the humans can be made to infer the false belief that the blend of affection, fear, and desire, which they call being in love, is the only thing that makes marriage either happy or holy. The error is easy to produce because being in love does very often in Western Europe and America precede marriages which are made in obedience to the enemy's designs. That is with the intention of fidelity fertility, and goodwill. Just as religious emotion very often, but not always, attends conversion. In other words, the humans are to be encouraged to regard as the basis for marriage a highly colored and distorted version of something the enemy really promises as its result. Two advantages follow. In the first place, humans who do not have the gift of continence can be deterred from seeking marriage as a solution because they do not find themselves in love. And thanks to us, the idea of marrying for any other motive seems to them low and cynical. Yes, they think that. They regard the intention of loyalty to a partnership for mutual help, for the preservation of chastity, and for the transmission of life as something lower than a storm of emotion. Now you'll notice what C.S. Lewis is emphasizing here is very much what the Pope is emphasizing also. And that is that the whole marital relationship, he says, wherever a man lies with a woman, 
a transcendental relationship is set up. Because that relationship was first of all created by God to be an image of the Trinity. To be an image by which one person gives themselves to another. And as a result, in a certain sense, now you can't say in the sense of the sacrament of the New Testament, because obviously the sin wasn't committed yet, that has a nature of a sacrament. In fact, Paul, as you notice in this epistle of the Ephesians, after he describes the marital relationship of Christ's union with the church, says this is a great sacrament, a magnum sacramentum. Now what does he mean by this? Well, he's not speaking of the more specific sense of the uh, sacrament of the New Testament, which we all know as an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace, though he's not necessarily denying that either. Instead, sacrament here is understood by him in the original meaning which it had in Scripture as the accomplishment of the eternal plan of God for human salvation. This accomplishment now involves the attempt by Christ to unite to the most ancient revelation of marriage in Genesis, to man shall leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, etc. Now, the more definitive covenant, the last covenant of God with the human race, the reason God created the world, as Paul says at the beginning of Ephesians, to choose us in Christ. In other words, to the erotic tendency toward another which has to be preserved by the ethical tendency in marriage to respect for fidelity, fecundity and friendship or mutual love and procreation and education to that now as a result of Christ's death on the cross is added the covenant which Christ himself established with his body the church where in spousal love Jesus gives himself wholly and completely to the church and the church in a sense as a society but including all of us as individuals has to give ourselves wholly and completely back to him to experience redemption. Uh, in this, the c- certain texts of scripture are very deeply fulfilled. Among them, let's see if I can find this on my Kindle quickly for you now. I have to trouble here. Let's see. Because uh, I want to be sure I get this right. I love this text. I hope that uh, you will like it too. By the way, it's uh, quoted It's in, in the um, Easter Vigil. It's one of the readings for the Easter Vigil. Yes, uh, Isaiah 54. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be put to shame. You will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says the Lord. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting mercy I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, what you should see here is that to the original desire of spousal love, in which people are called to look on the other as a second self, one to whom they can give themselves wholly and completely. And in the marital relationship, this is ratified in the gift of the seed. The child is a fruit of this. The way I always like to put this is that we bring forth little trinities. See, that's little children, images of the trinity. Little trinities, which reflect the big trinity when we have children, uh, is added now in the New Testament the desire to recover this relationship which was greatly put in jeopardy when we entered the time of widowhood. And the time of widowhood was when we lost grace, when we as a creation were thrust you know, apart from God, when we as a creation needed to be redeemed, and we not only needed to be redeemed by receiving back grace in our souls, 
but also, as Paul says in Romans 8.23, the whole world is waiting and we're groaning for the redemption of our bodies. And that means being able to experience our physical nature, and that includes our sexual nature, as a means, again, by which we can choose to give the gift of ourself to each other and not feel forced to uh, use another just for the sake of our own pleasure or to manipulate another to get what we want. In the sacrament of the New Testament, then, the covenant which was originally made by God in the beginning of the creation, shown to us in the first marriage, that spousal love, now has to be ratified in the mystery of God shown to us in Jesus Christ as he dies for his church. John Paul II puts it this way, the institution of marriage, according to the mode of Genesis 2.24, which remember was quoted in both our texts in Ephesians and in Genesis, and by the way is also quoted by Jesus in the question on divorce with the Pharisees. He quotes the same text, so it's a really important text, right? Um, he says, expresses not only the beginning of the fundamental human community through which the procreative power, which is proper to it, continues the work of creation, but also expresses the initiative in salvation of the creator corresponding to the free choice of man in Christ to which the letter of the Ephesians speaks. In other words, when human beings experience the marital sacrament in the New Testament, they are completing what God wished to begin in the original marriage experienced in the Old Testament before the sin. And they're completing this because the union which they have interpersonally with the Trinity through grace, Adam and Eve had this unity, but now it has a more special, a deeper meaning because it comes from a greater mercy. Namely, it's now experienced in Christ through his cross. And when we can see how much God loves us by being willing to die for us, that means that in our relationships with each other, we have to be willing to die to ourselves, to our desire to dominate and use and abuse each other. And when we experience the suffering which comes from this, we're actually participating in Christ's cross. When husband and wife do this, when they recognize that they still have a tendency to mutual manipulation. We've all got it. Lord knows we've all got it. What they're trying to do is fuse the original spousal meaning with the redemptive desire of Christ on the cross. And that's why uh, marriage is a cross. I mean, it's painful. I, when I do my little marriage sermon, which is rare now because I don't really work in a parish and I have rarely married anybody. I've married anybody for years. The last wedding I had was really something. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. I don't know if the priests in the audience would agree with me or not, but most priests find their most hated task weddings. The most priests would rather do 100 funerals to a wedding any day because the, besides the fact that you have to deal with Bridezilla, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, who's going to leave the church because you didn't let her sing her favorite song, um, you know, people have very little idea of what the Christian idea of marriage really is. This dying to others. I mean, I, you know, what? You know, the last wedding I performed was a kid I taught in high school who's an agent in Hollywood. And uh, he and his wife, a very lovely girl, but uh, she hadn't been uh, baptized yet, I don't think. And they married at Mission Santa Inez. So I showed up to do this wedding the night before it happened. So, uh, anyway, the woman says to me, uh, we're going to have a Tony Award winner sing at my wedding you know, from Hollywood. I said, oh, that's nice. And then I said, what's he going to sing? She says, my favorite song. So I kind of swallowed hard and I said, what? Oh, it can mean he's going to sing When You Wish Upon a Star from Walt Disney's Pinocchio. I said, don't you think it's a tad bit inappropriate for communion? She says, it's my favorite song. So, see, that's Bridezilla right there. And, I, and then she said, you know, my mother said the same thing. I said, gee, your mother's a wise woman. You should listen to her. 
But anyway, you know, these people, they come and they talk to you about their marriage, and it's like it goes in one ear and out the other. You wonder what the whole deal is, you know. Do they realize this is a sacrament? Paul says a great sacrament. It's the same as Christ dying for the church. Anyway, usually when I give my talk, I say, look, when you two put your hands together, you've got to remember that in this sacrament, Christ with his bleeding hands is surrounding yours. He's the one that's holding them together with the wounds on the cross. And when you have to suffer the death of your ego, it's not pleasant for any of us. And though being in love may be a wonderful thing, I mean, no right-minded person would think they're going to prolong the honeymoon for 50 years. You know, you, eventually you have to get down to the business of suffering for each other. And uh, boy, that just goes over like a lead balloon, you know. But spousal love, you see, that's, that's its character. Now, you may think we know nothing about spousal love, but one of the points the Pope makes in his uh, writings is that religious and priests don't give up spousal love. Because remember, uh, we're, at least religious is supposed to marry Christ. Now, it's, it's easier for a woman to work this image than a man to be the bride of Christ. But I mean, uh, everything that Christ is is supposed to be all to us, anxious about pleasing the Lord alone. And we're not giving up the nuptial meaning of the body. What we're doing is trying to realize it the way it's realized in heaven or the way Christ realizes it in the Mass. Uh, and the priest by offering the Mass and the sacrifice for others. That's why one of the fathers of the Church very graphically remarks, he who denigrates marriage denigrates virginity. Because we don't take vows of virginity because we think marriage is evil. Now, unfortunately, people look on us as doing that. Uh, I've, some of you who had me for talks before know I often quote in this context this uh, sister who was the academic dean at the seminary where I teach about 20 years ago. Our Sister Mary. I've never met anyone quite like our Sister Mary. I've known hundreds of religious women. I never knew anyone quite like this woman. This seminary was for second career vocations. So some of these people were widowers, right? They'd been married before. Sister Mary's vacation talk used to begin like this. Now, boys, when you go home on vacation, don't go out with the women. You tried that once, and you're not good at it. That's the reason you're here. <laughs> and I used to say, well, that may be the reason Sister Mary's here, but it's not the reason I'm here. <laughs> I don't know. The ability to give yourself totally as a gift of self to another is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. We have this because we have a reasoning soul. The angels have this. We have it. Marriage is the natural way to do this on earth, but also single people who are baptized do this. The baptismal relationship is a spousal relationship with the Trinity by grace. It will be finally realized in heaven. And priests and religious do this too. People who are widowers see this in this context. So we have to be able to jump this up to see it in the context of the great image of the covenant which Christ ratifies in his blood. Now one further point. John Paul II also talks about what he calls the language of the body as expressing the sign. In the liturgy in the matrimonial liturgy, you know, a husband and a wife, I take you for my wife, I take you for my husband. The Anglican ritual is especially beautiful about this. Uh, to thee I pledge my troth with all my worldly, uh, uh, with, with my body I thee worship. With all my worldly goods I thee endow. And by worship he doesn't mean worship a spouse as God. What he's expressing there is that the matrimonial sacrament is an action of divine worship. Remember, the ministers of marriage are the couple, not the priest or the deacon. We merely witness it. So, first of all, you speak the words of love. But then, in those words by which you accept each other, is assumed that this intention will be carried out in the consummation of the marriage. Remember, a marriage may be juridically contracted by the words what they used to call in canon law, ratum, rightly done. But if it's not consummatum, 
In other words, if it isn't carried out with the language of the body, expressing this in the gift of the seed by which you choose to give your seed to each other, respecting all the goods involved, that the marriage isn't fully constituted as a marriage. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the only instance of canonical divorce which can occur in Catholicism is if a marriage is rightly done but not consummated. Once a marriage is consummated, no power on earth, only God can dissolve or death such a marriage. So the sacramental sign constituted in the order of intention has to be ratified by the language of the body. And John Paul II, who has some really interesting ways of saying things, says that he calls this the prophetism of the body. And just as in the Old Testament, there were true prophets and false prophets, prophets are supposed to speak in the name of God. Well, if you're expressing the union of the Trinity through your union of hearts, and then you're ratifying this expression of Christ on the cross, the union of body, the union of body has to respect all the goods involved, which would be procreation and education and mutual help and fidelity and all that. If it doesn't, your prophecies are false. You're giving a false prophecy. Because what you're trying to do is you're re- trying to realize the language of the body in something besides the redemption of the body and divine creation. And John Paul II says this demonstrates that man is not completely determined by libido. Man, even in the state of original, we, we still suffer from the weakness of the original sin, where we have a tendency to hardness of heart, to lustful looks and things like that, is not merely accused by God of this, but when Christ redeems him, he's calling him out of this to experience the healing of this. And in the theology of the body, John Paul II uses two texts to do this. One is the Song of Songs, in which all kinds of different disinterested love relationships and tenderness are expressed. The tenderness which has to do with prophetism of the body is complete, provided all the goods are expressed. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. But when the tenderness is expressed trying to deny those goods, then the people are like false prophets. And then also the book of Tobit, which, if you remember, has quite a lot to say about praying. Remember, what is it? The demon kills all seven of the husbands of, who is it, Sarah, or whoever it is, and they have to pray the night before they get married that the demon will be excised from their relationship. In other words, let me just summarize this. In spousal love, in which you give the gift of yourself totally to another without manipulation and domination, This is eros, again, erotic love, directed to the self of the other through your emotions and your body, completed by ethics, ethos, self-control. But in order for that to truly flourish now, because of the original sin, this can only be brought to completion in its fullest sense in marital chastity, which is a virtue and a gift, in which man and woman experience in themselves spiritually maturely by self-restraining love and the only way that can happen is through the completion of agape and agape is basically in this context divine healing and redeeming grace so on Valentine's Day I just highly uh, want to point out to you the depth and power of the covenant that Christ has now brought to us and I want to emphasize that John Paul II says that in the general sense of God's plan for salvation, not the specific sense of the seven sacraments, but the sacrament of marriage is the most graphic sign of the way God loves the world, Christ loves the church, and how that love has to be returned. And when you, if you're Christian spouses, when you enter into that, then you truly experience the fullness of this great sacrament also. And since we're called to put on Christ and to act in his image, this is especially important external sign of what Christ's love for the church is like. So husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Wives give yourself to your husbands as the church gives themselves to Christ. This is indeed... A magnum sacramentum, a great mystery. Okay.
you have any questions or comments you'd like to make. Right. 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 Well, okay. Let's let's be clear about this. Uh, if a person sought the divorce, uh, they have to confess it is a sin before they go to communion. Now, what you're talking about is a person who's in the state of public, ex- more or less excommunicated, and they're not really formally excommunicated. But they're not allowed to participate in the sacraments if they're remarried outside the church because they're considered to be in a state of public adultery. How God views that, we have no ability to judge, but we have to do it regarding the sacraments on the basis of what the church's uh, legal structures involve. There are priests, unfortunately, who try to resolve these questions in the privacy of the confessional where they'll absolve people and then tell them, even though they're in a bad marriage as far as the church is concerned, that they can still go to communion. The catechism is very clear that we can't do that, except in the case of someone who's willing to live as brother and sister. Uh, Because we don't care what people gossip about, but if you're having sex and your marriage hasn't been blessed by the church and you're a Catholic... uh, you're living in a state of sin, objectively. Now, again, we don't. I'm talking about the person who's remarried, right? If you're not remarried, divorce is. If you sought it, especially, is still a sin. You could go to communion, but you'd have to confess, like any sin. You'd have to confess that sin. But you know, if a person came to confession to me and said they'd remarried, and there was no way they were going to go through an annulment process to even try to find out if their marriage could be annulled or whatever, and they wanted my permission to go to come in, I have to tell them I couldn't do that. But if they're not remarried, uh, and they've, uh, you know, accomplished a divorce, like I say, if they're a victim of it, it's one thing, because a lot of times people don't seek it. And divorce isn't the same as separation, remember. Uh, Separation basically maintains that though the people are really married, they, they shouldn't live together for various reasons. And also, civil divorce dissolves the civil effects of marriage. So things like um, ownership of property, inheritance rights, cohabit- necessity of cohabitation, legitimacy of children, all those things might be affected by civil divorce. But if it's a marriage made in the eyes of God, the civil divorce doesn't touch that part of it. And so um, a person who, tr- who looks on a civil divorce as dissolving a valid marriage it commits a sin. But there are lots of people today, I had to argue with one of our priests recently and tell me, no, there's no sin in getting a divorce. I said, it says right in the catechism, it's contrary to the natural law. Now, you know, hello. That means it's a sin. It's a sin, right. Well, it, I actually think it actually says that too. But, you know, sometimes you can't, uh, it doesn't, they'll say, I don't care what it says there. Now, what they mean is, of course, that the most difficult thing to resolve is divorce and remarriage outside the church. That's something that, you know, agreed. You just can't go to communion then. But if you sought a divorce unjustly, uh, you know, um, and you think that you've dissolved a valid marriage bond, then that's a sin itself and it has to be confessed before you go to communion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Father Buckley. Well, there are Uh, does marriage mean, the sacrament of marriage means one person or that other person? In which case, how do you explain second and third marriages? Well, because the relationship, of course, ends with death. So it's possible to have a similar relationship with another human being now that that's been dissolved by death. Although, I don't know, it's, it's interesting... Uh, I mean, you can do it, of course. It's, it's commonly done, and it's, it's fine as far as morals is concerned. 
But it's interesting to talk to some people who've actually had second marriages once their spouses died. Because um, I know one in particular, uh, she got married again, and she said, you know, it's just not Jimmy. (laughs) And she said, you know, I'll stay with this guy till I die, but I probably made a mistake. She was very funny. Um, He'd call her on the phone. This is one of my colleagues at work where I work at the seminary. And I'll say, somebody, that's just, that's just my husband. He's got to learn. He doesn't bother me at work. I trained the other one. I haven't trained this one yet. <laughs> that's what she says, you know. But it's, it's interesting, the first relationship, especially if it's been a happy one, it's, even though people do get married again for many good reasons, it just doesn't seem to be the same exactly. I don't know. But, um, yeah, of course, uh, you can have the same total gift of self to the other after the manner of this world. Uh, because the, the the promise to do that with the other person has been dissolved, but um, you know, it's, I think that's very uh, interesting. Why do you suppose the Orthodox Church would visit? Uh, a marriage a second time? I don't know. They have an interesting marital. Well, they have some interesting marital customs because, as you know, they allow one and one divorce. Yeah, you can get one divorce only. Uh, yeah, because they don't really recognize the indissoluble of marriage the same way we do. Uh, I, I, you know, I have great respect for the Orthodox churches, but some of their customs, because they were so highly influenced by the state, you know, because of, of Caesaro papism, some of their customs smack of just bowing a little bit to the civil order just to make things easier. Now, I don't know if that's true of this one, because I've never studied it deeply. But, uh, yeah. But once you, once you think about rooting yourself in the order of the Trinity and the Christ dying on the cross, it, it, it would even, divorce would be even more against the sacrament of the New Testament, because Christ doesn't come down from the cross. You know, he doesn't stop, suffer, stop dying because it gets hard. And uh, that's unfortunately what happens often. Now, again... People who are in, in especially physical abuse or cruelty or whatever, they don't have to cohabit. But that's not the same as dissolving a valid marriage bond. So, um, yeah, people are very confused about that, yes. Sure. Um, are deceased married couples expected to meet in heaven? Are deceased married couples expected to meet in heaven? Well, if you're in heaven, I suppose you'll meet. <laughs> Uh, everybody meets everybody else in heaven. And, you know, the Thomists were always of the opinion, unlike others, that whatever you, friendships you had here on earth, that you had a memory of all the things that had occurred here on earth, and they were all were subsumed in a certain sense into your relationship with Christ. So, yeah, I mean, you'll have uh, friendships in heaven that will mean more to you. And, of course, marriage, as you know, Thomas Aquinas says marriage is the greatest natural friendship among human beings. Of course, that person meant a great deal to you, but you're not married in heaven anymore. But, but since you're all one in Christ, whatever love you experience in Christ is especially experienced with those people. There's a wonderful question in the Summa where St. Thomas asks if the fellowship of friends is necessary for happiness. And uh, he says, yes, in this life it is, but to help us do virtue, not as drowning people that can't be happy with just being virtuous on our own because we love God but we see them do good they do good to us and they encourage us by correcting us and by directing us in the next life he says strictly speaking the fellowship of friends isn't necessary God alone will suffice but since there are all kinds of people also that are going to be enjoying heaven with us both angels and human beings of course there will be fellowship of friends up there you know, as a, a kind of accompanying good which I think is very beautiful and that would include your spouse yeah my opinion. Yeah. Somebody else? Uh, I have another question. Yes. Um, even though there might be a full, in, well, there, if there is a full intention to have children, is there ever a sin in delaying pregnancy by natural family planning at any point? Oh, this is the big, the biggie. Uh, yeah, is it a sin to de- delay having children at any point, even though you have the intention to have children? Well, coupled with the intention is, of course, a natural family. Let me put it this way. Natural family planning is objectively good, as opposed to contraception, which is objectively evil. 
However, in every moral choice, you have to know the object, the intention, and the circumstances. All right. So it's objectively good. The intention may be good. But then the question is, are the circumstances, do the circumstances justify this or not? Because the uh, weight of the church's uh, teaching has always come down on having children. That's what marriage is primarily about, right? So you could delay, but it would have to be, and there's always this for a serious reason. Now, nobody's ever defined a serious reason. I remember one fellow wrote to me, because I do this question column in Homilech and Passover Review, one very good priest whom I know wrote to me and said, well, couldn't you consider poverty a serious reason? And I said, well, if that were the case, we wouldn't have had any Catholics for the last 2,000 years because almost all the Catholics have been poor. I mean, really, you know. So I'm not sure poverty can be considered to be a... I, I guess it would depend on the kind of poverty. You know, if you were starving to death, that's one thing. If you just wanted two boats... That would be another thing, you know. Obviously, that's not a serious reason. Well, no, I mean, you know, people are very cavalier about this. I have a Jewish, I have a Jewish lawyer friend who's a very good man. But he, one point along the line, he had three children. And he said, well, you know, my wife got pregnant again. But we, I, had, I told her to have an abortion. I said, really? He says, yeah, we just don't have another bedroom. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough... This guy, who's a really a good guy, he and his, his wife's a Christian, but she doesn't practice Christianity. Uh, their second son, they lost in a car wreck at the age of 20. And they ne- haven't never gotten over that. That was like five years ago. Now you wonder, you know, about this thing of we didn't have enough bedrooms to have another child, and yet we lost this child. I mean, it's very strange, some people's attitude toward all this today. And, uh, so, and I had a deacon, a permanent deacon, who was studying for the priesthood, actually tell me once. He was in the East. He said, Father, you are living in outer space to suggest to a prospective married couple that they shouldn't live together. He says, they have to live together today, otherwise they can't support each other. But I was living in outer space. It may not be that easy to get them to not cohabit, right? But to even tell them I didn't think it was a good idea, that it was a sin. I was living in outer space to do that. I mean, I couldn't believe the attitude, you know. Um, and that's people's mentality today, you know. So it says a serious reason. Now, serious reasons, in my opinion, would be things like, you know, if the wife was told if she conceived again, her life might be threatened, or something like that. That would certainly be a serious reason for natural family planning. Uh, if you psychologically just don't think you can handle any more children and you've got a number, or you need a space birth, I think that could certainly be a reason. Because some people, you know, I mean, they're just stretched to the limit sometimes, psychologically. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to define that. The most important thing to keep clear is it shouldn't be for a trivial reason. Yeah. Third year of honeymoon, yeah, something like that, yeah. But I, I purposely give you extreme examples to show you a very trivial reason, and then you know, um, Ricardo Montalban. I don't know if you remember who he is. You know, the Corinthian leather and the Duplain boss, Duplain and Khan. Well, you know, he was married to Loretta Young's sister. And at a certain point along the line, they were told that for her to conceive might uh, threaten her life. So he said they prayed about this. They were apparently fairly devout Catholics. And they prayed about this. And he was on a retreat with a Jesuit retreat house in L.A. And they decided that they practiced the church's teaching on natural family planning. And what he said in his autobiography about this is very interesting. He said, you know, since this was a matter of choice for us, when we had the act um, and it wasn't something we felt forced to do when we did choose to do it he said it was like a second honeymoon every time <laughs> you know, like this so uh, you know self restraining love is what we all have to practice clerics have to practice it religious have, single people and married couples and the value of self restraining love is that when you do experience something that's really good that you've restrained yourself reasonably on for a time, then the good becomes something that you experience in such a more integrated way. And see, that's why 
uh, the pleasure even of the whole thing can be so much deeper and yet not lead you to an egotistical desire to just not care what the other one's like. You know, Bishop Sheen said one time, this is in the 50s, that in former times uh, people covered their parts with fig leaves. He says in the modern idea of sexuality you cover the face. But it doesn't matter who it's with, all you want is the pleasure. So you can see this by the terms people use about it. They'll say, like, I got some, or I got it, instead of her or him. You know, it's been completely depersonalized is the thing. And uh, so the church is generally against excessive Puritanism in this. The Puritanical idea is, that was condemned, by the way, by Pius XII. There was a long debate about this. But the puritanical idea was always that the pleasure of sexuality is a necessary evil tolerated for the sake of procreation. Now, Pius XII condemned that error. It's in the catechism, quoted, that the married couple experience legitimate pleasure. But then it says, provided it's placed within the proper boundaries of reason. Now, what does he mean by reasonable pleasure there? Does he mean a little as opposed to a lot? No, what he means is those that respect the goods of marriage, you know. So, uh, and in fact, there's a wonderful question in Thomas Aquinas where he asks if Adam and Eve would have experienced more pleasure in the conjugal act or less pleasure before the sin than we do. Now, the stoical attitude of many people, which looks on pleasure as sinful, uh, would be that they would have experienced less because they were more virtuous. And St. Thomas says, no, they would have experienced more And the reason is because they had more integrity in the choice, which is more or less what John Paul II means by this business of being naked and not ashamed. Although it's, the book is kind of hard. I I had a, I have a priest friend who's a Virginian. He comes from the Tidewater in Virginia. And he says, Father Brown, how am I going to home and tell my old mother that the Pope talks about original nakedness (laughs) in the Tidewater? But, I mean, uh, the idea is that uh, because there was no sin and because they had this integrity, that when they chose to ratify their uh, relationship with God, because that's the key, through their relationship with each other, that all of their forces would have been completely united on this, but there was no possibility of domination and manipulation for the sake of pleasure, which happens after the sin. That's what hardness of heart means in the lustful look. The lustful look, Jesus says, any man who looks at a woman with lust in his heart, the lustful look is when you look on another person using their body as a means which you can extort the gift of themselves from them against their will. And you don't give a fig for them and what they think or their feelings or anything like that or their freedom at all. And, And oddly enough, that's the difference between pornography and art. A pornographic representation of the human body is an attempt to elicit feelings of domination and manipulation. One, a stronger self preys on a weaker self using sexual values, because these are really powerful in us. It's easy to do, all right? Whereas the artistic representation, David, all those naked cherubs dancing all over the Sistine Chapel, uh, you know, is meant to bring forth the nobility of the human body as expressing the soul and self-restraint is the thing. Yeah. One of the big problems that we have today is the object. Yeah. Yeah. John Paul II says in this that in the original sin, hardness of heart has changed the subjectivity of persons to objectification. Where it's like, you know, you're just like a, an object of pleasure for me, period. In other words, it's good that you exist because you're created from the hands of a loving creator, it's now it's good that you exist because you make me feel good. And as as long as you make me feel good, I love you. And when you don't make me feel good anymore, forget it. You're worth nothing. I just throw you aside like this. What's conceptual love for the single person? Conceptual love for the single person? Well, that's where you give the gift of yourself uh, to God through him in your heart and baptism. And where you use this baptismal consecration as a means to uh, offer the service of yourself to those you live with or those you serve 
in your job or something like that. Right. Uh, it's somewhat similar to religious, except religious do this completely with no possibility of ever changing it. And they give up. Well, the religious renunciation, there are three objects of the vow of chastity. The religious renunciation is a physiological renunciation, the pleasure. It's also an emotional renunciation, the feeling of the desire to love and be loved. And then it's also a a paternal renunciation where the priests or the nun give up the, the desire to have physical children of their own. They don't give up, though, motherhood or fatherhood any more than they give a spouse a love. Because the same emotions and the same uh, defense of truth and good and nurturing that a man and a woman perform in a family toward their own children, the priest and the religious has to do to the whole human race. So Graham Greene has a great line of the power and the glory where he says, only a man with no children of his own can understand what it means to be the father of all. And the same with the nun. The woman takes the veil in the Near East when she becomes potential mother. And she's supposed to be the mother of all the living by nurturing, uh, you know, like women do, uh, the good in others through empathy uh, in, in everyone that she serves. I had a sister friend once who was once asked in her old age if she missed having children of her own. And she said, well, the sisters and I have discussed this, and some of them say they missed having children of their own. But I have to tell you that I never missed having children of my own because every child I ever taught I looked upon as my own child. And I would say that's true of everybody they serve. It's one of the reasons why the nuns were so good in the hospitals because, you know, they brought a dimension that a priest... I worked in a Catholic hospital when I was newly ordained that still had sisters. And believe me, it's so different now. I mean... Those sisters did 90% of the work for me because a, a person will much more readily talk to a woman than they will to a man in those straits. And so the sisters would come and say, go quickly, he's ready for confession. Like this, you know. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll cave in to a woman's empathy. Whereas if you're the priest, you walk in, you're like an authority and they put up a wall some of the time, a lot of the time. But with the women, they'll open up and then the sisters would come and tell you this is what needs to happen here or whatever. It's sad that they're not there anymore. Yeah. Now, uh, okay, I don't know when the next thing is. Uh, the first, well, we come out with the, the first uh, week of uh, first week of uh, Lent, and then the Father Search probes, and that will be in the bulletin, maybe not this weekend, but the following weekend. Have a nice time. Okay. And if you want to buy uh, some CDs of the Spousal Love Talk, I have a couple of them up here. And also a little pamphlet on Theology of the Body. All right, thank you for coming. And uh, we continue on with Dominican Forum. Welcome to take the sweet home, okay? Yeah. The more you can take more, better for us. <laughs> and, and Pastor says, no free will offering this time. So there you go. Okay. Thank you for coming on Valentine's Day. Thank you. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.